Thank you very much indeed. Um, people are still streaming in, but I think we're about an hour late so far out of three hours, which uh, some could say is a metaphor for project development timekeeping, but uh, <laughs> we won't dwell on that. Um, uh, I'm David Donaldson. I'm with IFC InfraVentures. I think you've been doing a lot of talking about IFC InfraVentures during the last session, uh, so I won't uh, try to squeeze in any more uh, commercial breaks. Um, I've been with IFC about 100 years or so, so uh, a long time, and this is my current configuration is to uh, help Alain uh, run IFC InfraVentures for Africa. So, uh, I would like to introduce my, uh, my panelists, and um, a particular thank you to the two at the end, uh, Sunil and Willem. So this panel looks completely different from what is on your program, including, uh, including me, me chairing it. Uh, Sunil and Willan uh, very, very kindly stepped up at the last minute and are, are going to be talking about our subject of the day, which, as Barbara says, is the nitty-gritty of project development agreements, co-development agreements, joint development agreements. How do we get into those agreements? What do they look like? And a particular issue we're going to pick up from Andrew Ali earlier on today, which is, is there some scope for standardization for making the process of agreeing with each other move more smoothly. Um, so let me introduce, uh, to start off with, uh, immediately on my left, Suvir uh, Ramdani is the Chief Development Officer for SECOM Shared Services, uh, underwater uh, fiber optic cable. Um, Christopher Campanova is a Senior Power Advisor uh, with the Initiative for Global Development. Um, Willem Terron uh, with ESCOM is their general manager for business development, uh, focusing on cross-border uh, transactions. And then finally, Sunil Kapoor has already asked a provocative question or two during the course of the day. He's uh, president of the Africa region for the Tata Power Group. Um, and so our subject, as I said, is the nitty-gritty of joint development agreements. Uh, how do they work? How might they be improved? <coughs> Uh, could governments uh, help to make them work better? Uh, so, um, so we'll open it up to the floor. I think, uh, I think the subject uh, in front of us is, uh, is how do co-development agreements, joint development agreements work? Is there mileage in standardizing them? Is there, is there scope for, is there scope for governments to intervene to, or, or, or governmental institutions, multilaterals for example, uh, to intervene to, uh, to assist in the formation of joint development agreements. Wasn't it Ronald Reagan who said the uh, nine scariest words in the English language are, uh, I'm from the government and I'm here to help? So <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe, maybe not, but uh, I'd be interested to hear of you. So questions, please, for our <laughs> panelists. <coughs> Uh, gentlemen over here, thank you very much. <coughs> ah, okay. You're next. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, sorry, I was very quick. I'm Tom Louis Olivier from New Planet. We're a hydropower developer, owner and operator here in South Africa. Not quite um, on the discussion topic, <coughs> but uh, I just want one comment to make on the PPA and then uh, I've got a question for Willem. Um, in South Africa, the PPA in the government's speeding tariff program is completely off the table. It's not negotiable. And I think I can speak for all developers that we were all astounded by the legal cost involved. So PPA is, is, is but a component of that. Um, and then uh, to, to Willem, uh, if I would like just to get a, 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 a response from you on why there's been such a delay in South Africa offering PPAs to these projects, these initiatives outside of our, our borders. We've seen our neighboring countries, Namibia buying power from IPPs in Mozambique, um, a lot of wheeling taking place, but uh, everybody's waiting for ESCOM to, 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 to act as off-taker. What's the barrier to, to that taking place, and uh, will we see that happening? Okay, thanks for that question. I, I'm going to ask for a couple more questions and then, uh, and then manage the responses from the uh, panelists so that we, uh, we're efficient. So the gentleman over here. 
<coughs> My name is still it's Bruno Venn. I'm chairman of DG. I have a, uh, not a question, but a comment to, to Christopher. I would like only to inform you that within the European Development Finance Institute and also with OPIC, we have agreed on minimum standards with regard to PPA, and, uh, and we would like to encourage uh, the colleagues also from the multilateral development banks also to join in, because uh, this reduces uh, the cost of doing business for all of us, uh, secondly, it, uh, it increases the speed uh, of doing business, and thirdly, also it reduces to some extent the cost, um, uh, 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 the risk. And also, I would like to encourage uh, the governments uh, and also the regional economic communities that, with regard to standardization of PPPs, there is an uh, there is an issue, and uh, we could easily unlock a huge amount of uh, public sector money if uh, this is, this issue is being solved. Thank you very much. I think there was another question over here. And then uh, Rosalind in the middle there. So let's let this gentleman go first if we could, Rosalind. Uh, a microphone over here for the gentleman in the corner. Thanks. Then if there's another microphone, it could head its way to your help. Okay. Thanks. Um, Christopher, uh, 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 this is probably aimed at, at, at the comment you made about standardizing the joint development agreements. Um, just, just your take on, on that. Um, you know, I, I think in my opinion, that's sort of a very much a document which gives call it the consortium a competitive advantage because it dictates how they work together. Uh, invariably, the, the consortium members are very disparate, dis, dis, you know, different groups depending on what you're doing. Um, to me, that would be a, an extremely tall order to A, make that, um, that document standard. Um, and certainly, a lot of consortium members wouldn't want that, that document necessarily open to scrutiny. Um, for the mere fact that it gives them uh, a working relationship and some competitive advantages. I'm all for, I, I think I'd be all for opening up the shareholders agreement um, and standardizing that. But um, I'd just like to hear your comments on, on the actual opening up the JDA and, uh, and standardizing that. Because I do think that takes away competitive advantage. Okay, thanks for that, Rosalind. Thanks, David. My question actually is looking at the past and, look, and drawing lessons from that for the future and it's directed at Willem. You've given your experience in ESCOM and you've said you've been doing this for over 20 odd years. So uh, the mistakes of the past, Westcorp and uh, the power projects that was supposed to have developed Inga 3 through a consortium model. Yesterday we heard from the PEDA panels about all these regional projects that are being looked at. What, sort, what are the lessons that you would say we need to learn from the, the past experience and the failure of Westco in getting Inga 3 developed? Wow. <laughs> Willem, welcome. <laughs> I bet you're really glad you joined this panel. Eh? Uh, so, um, I think we've probably got... Uh, is there anybody else who would like to ask one more question at the front area of Kofi? Yes, uh, it's uh, with regards to the... Um, the code developer uh, agreement being uh, being standardized, and I actually would agree with the gentleman there, but actually for different reasons. I, I think that the uh, it's a bit of it's a bit like a marriage, and uh, you don't know. I mean, the type of marriage are very different uh, according to the people that are getting married, and depending on how the the code developers get financed. For example, if they get financed by a private equity firm, you, you wouldn't get certain things. It, depending on how they make money, whether they're involved in construction or not, so you have conflict of interest, et cetera, et cetera, there are various aspects uh, that are uh, somewhat uh, customized, and I find it quite challenging to have, uh, um, I would say, standardized documents, but I'm happy to get comments on that. Okay, thanks for that. So, um, um, panelists, uh, Sunil, I, I, there's been, uh, there was a question about or a comment about legal costs being only an element of the overall project development costs. So I, 
interested to, and I know you have some views on that, uh, you could share those with the, with the room and then also maybe talk a little bit about uh, this question about a standardized JD, JDA and whether in your experience um, that, you know, that is a realistic aspiration. Christopher, maybe you could elaborate on, on, on that a little bit. And then Willem, I think you, 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 you have a series of questions there about uh, Inga and cross-border transactions more generally. So starting up with Sunil. So thank you, uh, David. The legal costs actually form a very uh, significant portion of the total costs. And at times, you see, where we, are, we should try and relate all of this to is that the ultimate test is the tariff, which the utility or any off-taker <coughs> has to take. For the smaller projects, the legal cost actually works out to a very large component of total cost. And having standardized documents, especially for the smaller projects, really is, is a shot in the arm because it helps bring down the total cost tremendously and makes those projects which are marginal viable. Otherwise, you know, a lot of these projects will fall out of the way. And, uh, you know, that's, 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 a, that's a view that we hold. For the larger projects, yes, there would be customization of, of legal documents and legal costs would be incurred. But at this point of time, it, you know, very often what happens is that um, the different sets of legal teams that work on projects from the lender side or they work from, from the developer side, it becomes almost a war of, uh, you know, trying to say who's right. And this adds so much of cost and it adds so much of deal time. Um, and of course, it does, uh, of course, help the lawyers you know, increase their billing. For instance, you know, we would find overruns in terms of legal costs going up to three to four hundred percent of what was budgeted. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, I think that standardization of documents to a large extent would, would alleviate this problem. Uh, thanks, Neil. Christopher, you want to add some thoughts on the development agreement? Sure. Um, well, first, before the JDA, I think the point was raised here about um, OPEC's minimum standards and, and the work that's been done around that for PPAs. I mean, it, I, I think that's great work. Um, and I think, frankly, um, you know, as a question of drafting or of lawyering, you probably could put something together that's, that's pretty damn good based on those principles that doesn't require, um, you know, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of hours of lawyering. Um, the other thing that <clears throat> IGD has been involved with, um, as well as the, the Power Africa folks in the Department of uh, U.S. Foreign and Commerce, was bringing together a number of, of financiers and, and, and lawyers um, who had been involved in power projects in Africa and, and drafted a, uh, a very useful document called Understanding Power Purchase Agreements. Um, and it's essentially a treatise on PPAs, but written for non-lawyers. Um, and I think this goes to the point you were making before about um, a lack of capacity or understanding and learning. <coughs> so, so we've been trying, along with the Department of Commerce, to, to get that document out so that the folks who are on the other side of the table from you who are negotiating agreements really do understand the whys and wherefores of a PPA. And, and hopefully, an iterative process over time, um, it'll become easier. Um, as, as far as, as the standardization of a JDA, I mean, I, I think you both raised very valid points. Um, I, I think, you know, I come from this issue from the perspective that as much standardization as can be accomplished ought to be at least tried. Um, and, and again, it's, a, it's about reducing transaction costs to me and, and development time. Um, certainly there are elements of a JDA that have to be flexible, that have to be kept confidential. Um, but um, there are also, I think, probably general principles that, that could be at least discussed and identified um, that, that might get us a little bit further towards um, some standardization. And, and again, the mantra just to reduce the transaction costs um, and, and, and provide what transparency is possible in the context of a negotiation. I think that, that would be overall useful. Great, thanks for that. And so, so Willem, a uh, uh, lifetime's experience in trying to struggle with development agreements across borders. Um, there's a couple of specific questions there for you. Okay, maybe I should start by responding to Anton. Yes, um, we don't have a big list of projects that we concluded, uh, but I can say that we've got Carapasa that was concluded in uh, 1970. I still don't understand how it was done. It happened. Uh, another good example of a uh, private transmission company is contracting. It happened. 
the business sense, I don't understand what it happened. And then, uh, yes, uh, we did close a, a Greco deal, a very small deal. <laughs> but I think what happened, um, or maybe I should say that we had a very good project in Namibia, we had a very good project in Botswana, and we still have a very good, uh, good project in Mozambique. The first two, the environment was not right, to conclude. And if I say environment, is there was not an enabling framework. So, but nowadays we're very clear who's the procurer and who's the buyer. So the Department of Energy will solicit uh, opportunities and then say for certain technologies we want this and this and this. They issued the gas RFI last week or the week before that and hopefully I will see a lot of, uh, we will see a lot of responses on that RFI because we don't have gas in South Africa so I'm sure there will be a lot of gas coming from uh, the neighbours. So that's my uh, wish for that. Uh, but it's very clear, uh, in RFP there's 2,609 megawatts earmark for hydro imports. So it's very specific import. So those deals will happen. Uh, gas and coal is uh, more generic to say, but it does not exclude uh, or limit it to South Africa as well. So, but I'm sure it will uh, come about. The biggest barrier is the transmission cost. Because you can imagine you want to build something in the northern part of Mozambique. Uh, there's a certain price uh, at plant gate. As soon as you add the transmission costs to the border, you can't compare it. You can only do it cheaper in South Africa. You can't justify it. But in the new general regulation, there is provision for that, that the minister may determine uh, for strategic regions or for regional cooperation, whatever, on specific projects and I do foresee some of those will be advanced like that. And then on West Corp, yes, we all learned lessons there. I think um, the excitement was very, uh, was too big. Uh, people concluded an agreement quickly before it was well thought through. Uh, it was different players, different languages, different uh, legal systems. Um, but in the success, uh, Grant Inga, uh, what happened is two parties, so there was a seller and a buyer, two countries entered into a intergovernmental memorandum of understanding to reach a treaty on this agreement. It was reached, it was signed, and uh, we know in the long run that ESCOM uh, will have to buy on behalf of government and import that power. Government asked us to sort out the transmission solution, uh, so we in discussions with the transit countries. So in my mind, I think it will happen. We're very clear who's getting what from the 4,800 megawatt and where's the transaction point. Uh, so that's something that we're busy with, so it will happen. And that's not to say that the other projects are referred to as dead, uh, but we just have to reapproach it and with time we will sort it out. Great, Willem. Thanks a lot. So I think we have time for maybe a couple... Nope. <laughs> it turns out we don't have time for a couple more questions. So I'll just conclude by thanking our uh, panellists for stepping up uh, so quickly and uh, for, um, for relating their experiences to us. We could have kept going for hours, but hours are not available. So I'd invite you to thank them all and say goodbye. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.